Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm Adrian Crockett. I am the general manager for Microsoft Cloud Financial Services, and I've got Nick Reed here. Hi, from... everyone. So today we're going to be talking about empowering the next generation of generative AI um, at, within financial services. So we're excited to bring you through a little bit of a journey around co-pilots and agents and what we've seen over the last 18 or so months. Now, in doing that, I always think it's very, very important to be respectful of where we're actually starting from. So sometimes in software design or product management, we often see people ignoring where we're starting from. And we don't want to do that. So this is the image that many of us associate with financial services. So every time we see a movie, we see someone walking through a trading floor, and it looks something similar to this. I sat in front of exactly this sort of environment for about 20 years. I almost got my suntan from the number of monitors in front of me. So when we are actually thinking about this, the one thing that we don't often think about is where are these applications coming from? So let's just break that down a little bit into a couple of steps. So the first thing that we actually see on a desktop in financial services are a number of apps from ISVs. So the average user that we actually see is using about 30 different ISVs. That's a lot. However, in addition to that, anyone from a bank out there or financial services firm? Hands? You developers by any chance? Yeah? Yeah? That's why you're here. What do you guys do? You also create applications for your end users. OK. This is very, very different to many other industries. The number of engineers that we actually have in financial services firms themselves is astronomically large versus other industries. If you were to compare the number of engineers inside financial services to retail for argument's sake, you've got a very, very different picture. Many other industries have effectively keep the lights on functions in technology. They are not developing software. So now we have all the software that's actually being generated by the financial services firms. And I am pleased to say that there's also a lot of Microsoft properties. So I don't think anyone's going to fight me with the importance of Excel within financial services. It's not going too far to say that finance runs on Excel. It's critically important. We have other key applications like Teams, which are also permanent on the desktop. So really, when we think about this, it's actually the combination of all of these different tools that get us to done. Now, why is this important? And why am I bothering with that message? Because we need to think about what the end user's experience is today. When we're thinking about the evolution to generative AI, we need to think about where we're actually starting off with. So, I've just drilled down into this, so let's start off. We start off with one singular app. What's the first thing that anyone does when they're actually looking at generative AI experiences? They introduce an assistive experience. What am I really talking about there? They put a side panel in, and they have a co-pilot in there or an agent in there. Now. One funny thing that I've done here is I've actually introduced a, a one concept here that I just want to touch on. So often when we see discussions around co-pilots, agents, we actually see a natural language prompt and also a natural language response. Within financial services, it doesn't normally go down that well. There are certain areas where it goes down well, but financial services people are generally attuned to actually seeing insight delivered through charts and tables. So the prompt that, or the response that I've actually given there is more akin to a micro app. We can actually express that. So you know, the example I always like to think about is if I ask about the share price of Home Depot in natural language, I do not want to actually know the share price of Home Depot. I want to know the share price of Home Depot. I want to know that with some context. How has the share price moved? I probably want to see it visually also. I also might want to tweak the return variable a little bit. I might want to change it from the last six months, the last year, or the last week. All those elements. So within financial services, we've really seen this gaining traction. So this really started to happen last, I'm going to say last November, were the first instances where we actually saw this. 
But why I've got Nick here today is critically important. I'm going to tell this story about the evolution of what we've been doing and seeing in financial services, and Nick has actually been on this journey from the start. Sure. Well, why don't we go to the next slide, okay. Adrian? We can talk you through. We, this is our exact evolution. Um, so for those people that don't know, Moody's is more than just the ratings agency. Uh, about half of the company is a data analytics and insights business. And lots of that data and analytics and insight is delivered to customers through software. And so when we were approaching the topic of the leveraging of Gen AI for our customers' benefit, this step, this idea of a side panel, this idea of a very small step into the generative world made the most sense to us, in part because most of our customers were financial services firms that said, thou shalt not use ChatGPT using a work machine, and we wanted to be able to have a slow and soft way of introducing them to generative technologies without breaking their compliance risk and legal department's brains because they weren't quite ready yet to be able to work out how to solve the usage problem. And so we refer to these panels on the right-hand side as navigators. And we think they're relatively well-named because predominantly what they're doing is giving you natural language insight into how to use the product itself. And so we don't charge for them. They just become part of the product, but they're a small step and a low barrier to entry way to get our customers used to interacting with our products using natural language. And so, again, I won't denigrate them too much. They're a little more sophisticated than a help bar because they do surface and give you access to information that you might not previously have known existed, and they're context sensitive, so they give you an ability to be able to um, provide natural language responses plus context plus citations and an ability to access underlying information that sits inside our software products. Um, but they changed the dynamic of the customer experience. Again, I can tell you that customers were comfortable to say yes to continue to using the product because it didn't need legal review because it sat inside our software product. And the experience changed. And so we saw something like a 10% bump in NPS scores of products that had navigators deployed to them to those that didn't. And so our job was to say, well, if that works, then how do we build out these kind of side panel experiences inside as many products as we can? So Nick, the, you know, the data that we see coming back from these sort of side panel experiences, I associate them with discovery, right, yeah. or discoverability. And I think it's interesting because we can look at that from a couple of different perspectives. Yes, it's a great tool for discoverability, but perhaps sometimes it's actually caused by the complexity of the UX taxonomy that we commonly have in financial services. 100%. You, so you think we're building a single pane piece of software that needs to service lots of personas and lots of different use cases. And so we've had to design a menu structure. We've had to design a set of applications that drive to the most common use case or to the best and most logical structure but it might not necessarily work for every individual persona or every use. And so these side panels and the way in which people then interact with the content that gets serviced is much more intuitive and it's much more uh, context rich. So it really works. That's part of the reason why people gain more value out of the product. Like I said, they already had access to all of this content to begin with, but they've now got an ability to access it in a much more user-friendly way. Great. So Building on that theme of discoverability, we actually see the next experience that people um, immerse themselves in, which is weirdly I'm going to call the immersive experience, is I actually take away, in many respects, the core application and I put in its place an agent. So what you'll see on this you know, sort of schematic is on the left-hand side, we'll actually change the navigation of this entire application. Left-hand side, there is the option to go in to a chat experience. This now becomes the dominant experience. If someone still wants to go into what was previously the core application, they see the same picture that we just saw on the previous page. Now, I think this is super interesting because we see two major use cases here. We see the success of the experience that Nick was talking about really giving rise to this. So people who have got existing applications, often with complex UX taxonomies, then they see the success of the assistive experience, and then they look to take that to the next level, come up with the immersive experience. There is also another place that we actually see a lot of use here, 
and that is for firms who do not actually have a front end. There is no front end today. So if you imagine that I'm a data vendor who just has data APIs, I have a choice, which is create this complex UX, which we all know is going to cost quite a penny. Alternatively, I actually leverage these types of experiences. Now, I think for that class of partner and customer, when we actually get to generative UX, let's call that two years, that is going to completely change the game there. But Nick, do you want to tell us about your immersive experiences? Sure. So I guess we learnt from the early adoption and usage patterns in the navigators that there were, I'll call them, more sophisticated customers um, that had more sophisticated consumption patterns that we couldn't satisfy within any one product. And so in this case, uh, we launched a standalone generative application. We call it Moody's Research Assistant. It runs on top of Moody's.com. So if you're a subscriber to all of the Moody's content on Moody's.com, then you can buy access to Moody's Research Assistant. And you're right, it goes beyond the, the kind of limited surfacing experience into a much more immersive experience that gives us a better ability to be able to understand intent and context and to surface a much broader set of information and to start to build into that information, I'll call them micro workflows. And so rather than being call and response, it's much more generative in nature. It's, it, again, I would say there's lots of products in the market that you can buy today that are called Gen AI products. And really, they're natural language search engines. This kind of product starts to migrate into the truly generative world where you're taking a corpus of content and information and you're building an application to surface net new content based on the way in which someone interacts with the prompt. And so that's unbelievably value adding to our customers because it means they can stay inside that one application. And it has the benefit to Moody's of being able to surface content that might be available to you that you don't necessarily subscribe to. And so in this case, we would say, well, we want the Moody's research assistant to give you a singular answer. So we want it to be the Moody's answer. And the ability to answer is based on our total corpus of information. But your ability to access all of the underlying citations, for example, is going to be driven by your subscription. And so we'll still give you a singular answer. But if you want to dive deeper, if you want to do more, you can do that inside the application on the basis that you've subscribed to that content set. So it's a great cross-sell and upsell um, opportunity for us. No, I think you know, sort of for ISVs, the idea of actually leveraging this as an upsell vehicle is exceptionally exciting from my perspective. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine you're asking a question in here about a particular industry. We also have some data about the climate implications for that industry, but you don't subscribe to the climate data. Then we can seed it with additional information that might help you in the first instance and an ability for you to subscribe to that additional data set if you want to do more. Yep, excellent. So let's now go into the next layer, where we start to think about we're actually bringing the core app back, but this time the core application is actually Teams. We're bringing in an agent here. So this is all of a sudden starts to be an alternative distribution channel. So if we think about the ubiquity of M365 across financial services, everyone has already got Teams on their desktop. Now, that has a big ramification because people don't need to log in to the other system to actually get value. I think the other thing that's super interesting here is many of you will have seen the announcement at Build where when I'm actually having a conversation with someone, so if Nick and I are actually collaborating on Teams, I can now actually bring in a co-pilot to that discussion. Now, that has a big, big ramification when we think about organizational design of financial services firms. The team solving the problem is now me, Nick, and the agent. We are working in cahoots to get to done. And that's a super exciting evolution that we actually see there. So the other thing that I will just note in this particular instance is I don't actually have a prompt here. I'm actually just going into the response. So also recognizing the ability to leverage true agentic workflows here is a really exciting evolution. So Nick, your experience is at this level. Yeah, we're going to take one step backwards to take one step forward. So the first implementation of this kind of inside Teams 
experience that we built was for ourselves. So we built a thing called the Moody's Copilot. And so this was deployed inside Teams to all 14,000 employees at Moody's. It was our response to um, us also being in that cohort of customers that said, thou shalt not use ChatGPT on your work device. This was the way that we allowed people to be able to have ubiquitous access to generative technologies inside an existing communication channel that they were already approved to use. And then all we were really focused on doing is saying, all of that activity is now going to occur inside Teams, inside an app, which means you can invite the Moody's Copilot, just like Adrian described, into a chat, into a Teams conversation. Um, and we started to then seed that application with a set of skills. And so we gave it access to lots of internal databases inside Moody's, which allowed people to be able to stay inside Teams and undertake more and more activity. And so the example that you're seeing here is just access to um, the entity database that we have inside Moody's to be able to say, and if the chat that we're having relates to a particular entity, how can I surface that information without needing to step outside of Teams, go to another application, copy and paste that information, and bring it back into Teams? And so we've been really focused on how do we deliver as many skills as we can inside that Teams environment to allow our employees to kind of maintain the flow, to stay in the flow of their conversation. So I think the, you know, sort of thinking about how you actually build an agent and how you slowly build out that skills there is really critical here. And I think, you know, sort of in the next stage of evolution, and I will say, this is where we are today. So in terms of a time series, we're right at this point today. So now what we're actually seeing is a combination of different things. So we're definitely seeing what Nick was talking about then, which is agents building them out with more and more skills over time so that they're, they're more and more valuable. But we are also seeing something else, which is multiple ISVs and also customers leveraging their agents to actually allow us to get to done. Now, you might be asking, why did Adrian show me all those desktop pictures in the first instance? It wasn't because I just like to replay history. It's because this picture is actually very, very similar to what I showed you before. This is a combination of ISVs, customer applications, and also Microsoft applications, although now I'm going to call them agents, working together to get to done. What else has hit, happened here? I've actually got this on one singular canvas. This is all inside M365 Copilot. So now I can go in here, and I'm going to one place, and I'm saying, at Moody's, help me out. At Elseg, help me out. At BlackRock, help me out. Because I always had all those different things on my desktop to get me to done. So Nick, any thoughts about how you're thinking about this stage of the evolution? Yeah, I guess the benefit of this evolution is the containment of context. I guess that's the way that I think about it. So when you're trying to complete a workflow, when you're trying to undertake work, the complexity if you like, in the past, used to be having to step between applications. Um, and so you can combine all of those applications into a single screen. And I would say the kind of five years ago version would literally have been window panes on side one screen. But you didn't get a sense of context. You didn't get an ability to be able to step between those applications and remember to understand what you were trying to achieve, what you were trying to do, what context and data you had access to, and an ability to be able for that information to be able to flow between applications without just hitting copy and paste. And so part of the benefit here is you can step between agents, and the agents can um, ingest previous content, Con uh, previous context. context yep. um, and so we think that's going to significantly change the efficiency of work, and also just um, the experience, the user experience in general, like I said, in where we've started to put that in front of our own people, it drives just a completely different kind of knowledge worker experience. And I think, you know, drilling into, you know, or continuing with that analogy, what I talked about when we came into Teams, now what you can actually see here is two humans plus three agents working together. So again, you know, I really want to double down on how much this actually changes the future of work. So I'll let you walk through, Nick, some of the things that you're actually doing in this area. Sure, so what you see on screen 
is a mock-up of what it looks like when you start to combine lots of Moody's agents together. Because you've got to remember, we also have multiple data sets, multiple assets that have information about credit or information about um, sanction screening or information about um, private companies or news. And so we've got an ability to be able to call each of those agents and display all of that information inside a kind of single window, which, as we mentioned before, gives us an ability to cross-sell and upsell people on the content. But it also means that they can traverse across that content set within a kind of single context. Um, and if I orient you to the part that's on the right-hand side of the screen, because these are agents, and because you're interacting with them, you've got an ability to give them instructions. And this is a really simple instruction, which is, I want to know about this thing again. So if one of the agents is giving me a warning or some insight into credit risk or sanction screening or, um, or news sentiment, and I say, when that changes, let me know. Or in a month, let me know. And so now I've got an ability to start programming my agent so that it can be a little more interactive with me. So rather than it just being about call and response in that kind of prompting context, now that this is a more agentic workflow, I've got an ability to say, what outcome do I want, and how do I instruct the agent to make sure that I get the outcome? So, and the, the thing, you know, the example that I always think of when I'm looking at these screens is KYC, right? If I'm actually going through a process, I'm looking at a net new corporation, yes, I'm gonna actually investigate it at the time when it comes across my desk, right? That's what we all do. But the reality is, I might only do that quarterly or semi-annually, or in some banks, never, unfortunately. These sorts of workflows allow us to delegate to the computer and for it to tell me when there's actually a problem. So I love that, right? It's, you know, often when we're thinking about AI, we're often baselining versus how the human's performing. The reality is, is the human isn't actually performing a lot of these tasks. So this is actually capturing a whole lot of value that the human was never executing on. I, that really resonates with me. Credit risk is the best example of that. Anyone that's worked in a bank, you do a massive amount of work to be able to decide that I'm going to lend someone money. And then, historically, we just never talk about it again. We pretend like whatever the financial cir circumstances were for that entity exist in perpetuity until they go into default. And so what we're now starting to enable is an ability to say, well, actually, now that I've got a counterparty in my lending book or my lending portfolio, if something of interest might impact the decision that I made, let me know about it. So while I'm making the initial credit decision, find out and understand the context of that credit decision, and then if anything changes over time, just let me know. So if there's a news article that impacts the supply chain of that counterparty that might have impacted their credit worthiness when I made the decision, I'm going to know about it when it happens in the future. And so that fundamentally changes the way that you make decisions and that you manage decisions. Again, especially relevant in bank lending and portfolio management, because these are things that are not static. So, Nick, we're about to play a video of some of the things that we are expecting out of Moody's over the forthcoming period. Any intro you'd like to give there? I mean, what you're going to see is what I just described in practice, which is the ability for people to engage in a conversation to undertake an actual decision-making process inside teams and to create a set of alerts that will allow them to be able to feel a sense of confidence that that decision is being managed on an ongoing basis. This is gonna be pretty significant. This is gonna change the nature of the way that people that work in those kinds of tasks both undertake their tasks and manage their day. Great, so with that, we will both be quiet. <laughs> With over 550 million organizations worldwide, getting accurate and up-to-date information about businesses can be daunting. Microsoft and Moody's are here to provide you with the precise data you need, when and where you need it. Meet Tyler, a relationship manager at Contoso Bank. He just received a referral from Fabricam. A customer is seeking a $25 million line of credit for market expansion. He uses Microsoft 365 Copilot in Teams to quickly assess Fabricam's risk. Using Moody's proprietary company grounding service, Copilot identifies the correct company, Fabricam Incorporated, along with other potential matches, using the data in Tyler's Microsoft Graph. He sees rich contextual information for Fabricam based on previous email exchanges, chats, and CRM data. 
This gives him a complete view with the integrated Trusted Insights, the latest rating sources for Moody's. The rising credit risk and news sentiment merit further investigation. To dig deeper, Tyler reaches out to Maya, a credit manager in charge of assessing client credit worthiness. To determine whether Contoso Bank would be interested in the business, our credit manager runs a preliminary risk assessment with the Contoso Risk Agent, powered by Moody's premium data and skills. The agent summarizes key financial metrics and risk, allowing her to dive deeper into performance trends. Financials, sanctions, cyber risk, news sentiment, and macro environment are available in a single view. She notes a slight decline in the operating revenue over the past few years, despite healthy macroeconomic and cyber risk trends. So she decides to compare this against other U.S. manufacturing firms with similar operating revenue. The data shows revenue declines across all companies, but Fabricam stands out with steady cash flow and higher EBITDA margins, making them a strong candidate for the credit line. Next, Maya uses the agent to set up an alert for monthly updates about shifts in Fabricam's credit risk score, or sanction status. Eager to move the process along, Tyler asks Copilot to draft an email to his manager, summarizing previous interactions with Fabricam and the current risk assessment. With this quick turnaround, Tyler knows he can respond faster than the competition and is well positioned to secure the deal. So, I hope everyone's excited about that near-term future. Um, this is, you know, when I look at this, it is really the combination of thinking about AI augmentation, but also the things that were not previously done. And you know, everyone will talk about productivity, AI augmentation, and that's easy for us, for us to understand, but it is also those tasks that were not being done, which you know, sort of really resonates with me. It's funny, lots of the focus that we've had so far is on all of those tasks that aren't specifically in a workflow tool. Yep. It's all the stuff that if you went and spoke to someone that did this job, don't appear in a manual anywhere, but they're passed on, they're, they're the extra little bits and pieces that you need to do to be able to get ready to enter the formal workflow process that sits inside a particular system but they happen to take a long period of time. They're subject to lots of um, kind of inherent knowledge of the person that's undertaking them. And the ability for that to happen inside one application um, clearly drives the ability for that knowledge to be retained by the entity. But it's the experience of the user that's dramatically changed here. So the other thing that some of you might not have picked up on that video is we were showing a Moody's agent. So everyone saw the Moody's agent at the start. But there was then also some magic that was actually happening there. You actually got into a Contoso agent. The person was actually working in the bank, but Contoso had actually leveraged Moody's skills in actually creating their agent. And we're seeing that more and more. People not thinking about the top end of the experience, but the molecularization of what co-pilots are and the co-pilot stacks and where the opportunities for monetization and helping get to done actually occur there. So I think that's you know, sort of something when, you know, sort of, even when I first looked over the video, I sort of glossed over that a little bit. But I think it's a fundamental shift in the way that we're actually going to see financial services problem solved. Yeah, it feels like there's always been a gap between the availability of information inside an organization, particularly in financial services, which is usually pretty rich if you bank that customer or if you provide insurance to that customer, and third-party data. And this allows us to blend those two sets together to leverage the best of both. So that's where we are today. So on the previous slide, or two slides ago, I mentioned that this is where we are in the evolution, but there was this interesting thing that actually happened. As soon as we actually started putting all these agents together, then there's an obvious question that actually comes up. If they're in a singular canvas, should they not actually speak to each other? Can you actually not get interoperability between these agents? And for those of you who have been in capital markets in particular, I think we've been after interoperability probably only for the last two decades. 
We've never succeeded, and in many respects, I think we never succeeded because of the image that I showed you at the outset. There were hard borders around each one of those applications. People were building a wall around their application, but as soon as you actually start to see this view, there's almost a light bulb moment that goes off for everyone, which is the mere existence of this in one canvas actually makes you ask, shouldn't these things talk to each other? There is then the other side of the coin here, which is interoperability has been very hard to achieve with very rigid standards. So an obvious question that I could ask you, Nick, is how do you think about interoperability in the age of Gen AI? Yeah, I guess if you take, when I was talking about context before, and the user experience. This is just the natural conclusion of delivering context and a user experience that makes sense. And even though, in this case, we might only be one of the providers that appears on this screen, because we provide one of the agents, we think that there's enough value in the things that we provide that we should be able to expose it so that it delivers a much better customer experience. And you're right, it, the difference this time is the borders come down. You don't need to hardwire these things together. You don't need to put our data in one of our competitor's data assets, or you don't need to hardwire a third-party data asset into a different piece of software. You just need to make these assets and these agents available inside a canvas. And so Teams makes the kind of perfect canvas to be able to say, if I had all of these skills and agents available, they can inherit context from each other, and they can actually deliver even more value to the underlying customer. So many firms are now working on this together. So I'm going to throw you under the bus, Jared, over there. <laughs> so Jared is working with Finos, FTC3, and a whole bunch of the companies I've mentioned here, including Moody's, to reimagine what interoperability is actually going to look like in this age of Gen AI. So once we're actually there, you know, there's now I've shown you six different experiences, five of those co-pilots or agents. I think the next question that you should be asking is, well, which one do I do? <laughs> and we have the answer there in the crowd. Okay. However, what I want to talk about here a little bit is this is not an or decision. I don't do two or four. What I the way that I really want to think about this is very similar to the way a marketer would think about this. I actually want this isn't as many distribution channels as possible. If I've invested in the agent, I want to push it across all the distribution channels. So the philosophy here is very much an and. Now, I said before, you know, sort of that often people will ask me this question from the perspective, and they'll phrase it something similar to, Adrian, for persona X, which one of these things should I do? And the problem is it's not actually a persona decision. It's actually a task decision. So just to, you know, sort of simplify this a little bit, the experiences that we started to show very, very early on, I was in the core application, and then I added an assistive experience. That is going to be a very, very focused task. It's going to be something that I normally do by myself. And now I'm getting help from an agent. Fantastic. At the other end of the spectrum, Nick and I are solving a problem collaboratively. We then bring in three agents to help us get there. That is a very, very different type of question. Now, to add a little bit of you know, complexity here, I've just put a dot, dot, dot line right down the bottom of those focus tasks. Because the one question that will be asked over the next couple of years, are they tasks that should be fully identified? If they are so focused, can I not actually think about them from an identification perspective? So we're not there at the moment, but I'm sure many of us in this room are going to be living that question over the next couple of years. It's funny, Adrian, one of the things that we've learned as we've started to build out these agents is that it's easier to build them and make them be as specific as possible because orchestrating them together is actually not the complicated part here. What you want is very task-orientated, very specific, very focused on outcomes and delivering against outcomes. Um, and so then, again, the ability to deploy them, the ability for those agents to interact with each other is what drives additional value, but we're focused on trying to create agents at the task level. And the way that I think about this is if, you know, 
probably got a designer or two in the audience here. If someone was helping me draw out a user journey map, right? Dot, 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 dot. I'd have a lot of steps or tasks in that journey map. I'm going to end up having an agent for each one of those steps. Now, some of those agents are just going to do the task for me. Some of them are going to be very human in the loop, but the whole process is going to be dramatically compressed. So, how do we actually get to AND, Copilot Studio? That is my only plug in this discussion. But Copilot Studio is really the way that we are focused on making the agents and then being agnostic in many respects to where we actually distribute them. Now, within financial services, that's a really interesting question, right? Because Nick could build an agent and want it to come into a Microsoft Surface area. He could build an agent and want it to go into another ISV surface area, or he could build an agent to go into a customer surface area. We want Nick to be agnostic to any of those, thinking about those maximal distribution channels. So I, I'm now going to actually play a video, which is going to go through a couple of the different partners that we're actually experiencing at the moment. Um, Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. OK, so this is about 20 or so, oh, sorry, Pilot 13 vendors. The so we'll just go with through this quickly. Agents enabling financial services everywhere, turning oh, hours right. of work into seconds. Meet our Copilot is transforming the workplace with agents enabling financial services everywhere, turning hours of work into seconds. Meet our partner network, using agents to create unparalleled value for our customers. Unlocking financial services specific skills to meet your needs wherever you are. We are reshaping the ecosystem for tomorrow. What are you waiting for? So I'm not going to do any better than that call to action. So what are you all waiting for? Um, so for me, you know, sort of the really interesting thing here is what we can see from that video is realistically the picture that we actually painted for you around multiple agents working together in one canvas. So you can really imagine that. So imagine a scenario where I've actually trying to track the differential, it's capital markers example, so forgive me for everyone who's a banking or insurance person, but I'm trying to track the differential between an implied rating and an actual rating from Moody's. I've actually asked the agent to track that maybe three weeks ago. The agent's working in the background for me all the time. I think it's important to recognize that when it doesn't alert me, it's still working. Most people don't recognize that, but it's an important thing here. OK, it's now come back. Adrian, wake up. It's game time. Then I actually look at that, and I actually say, well, I've got that data from Moody's, 
That's, I'm now springing into action. I'm now at LSEG. I get the price for the fixed income security. And then the next thing I do is I actually pull up my portfolio in Aladdin. So you can start to see how this all comes together. And the three examples that I've just given there were all in that video. So that is a now thing. So the final thing that I really wanted to talk about a little bit, and for those of you who were in some of Charles's conversations, you might have seen this screen before, but this is really how we're anticipating co-pilots and agents transfer, transforming the way that we actually work. So I think you've seen throughout the discussion today that there is a big difference in the expectation around what UI is going to be. So we historically have been, for the last 15 or so years, very, very focused on apps. We're going to see an increasing transition to Copilot. Now, I think the th funny thing for me, within financial services, we have used the phrase micro app widgets for a long period of time. If I look at a terminal within financial services, it's often got a lot of little widgets in there. Those little widgets are now going to come into Copilots as the micro apps that I was talking about before. Workflows are going to be broken down into tasks that are then represented by agents. So we spoke about that example of breaking down the customer journey. Each stop on that customer journey we're expecting will be an agent. And then data is going to turn into knowledge. So we've been thirsting for the ability to actually take data up through the knowledge curve for a long period of time. So the speed at which we can do that, and also importantly, the democratization of that is going to accelerate greatly. So I will say that Nick and I have never spoken on stage before together where we actually had three minutes left. <laughs> we normally go over a little bit. We should have explained at the start that you don't have to be Australian to be involved in this conversation. We just You don't have to be Australian. You have to be. But it does help. <laughs> so any questions from the audience? OK, Jared has got a question from online. All right, there's a question from Brenda Gonzalez who asked oh. if you can look up GICS codes for a specific company using the Moody's agent. Yeah. You can. Um, in fact, you can look up a whole bunch of IDs if you want to. Part of the benefit is um, it'll search against the knowledge graph to say, what is it that you're interested in? You can search by name, by code, by any of those codes. And then it'll bring back uh, a set of reference data that can be then leverageable against the skills and agents. OK, we had a question up here. If it's hard, it goes to Nick, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a very you know, technical person. I uh, put my hands on the keyboard always. So I got completely apps as a UI to Copilot, workflows to agents, but data to knowledge. If you can double down with an example, yep. that would be very helpful. So I think within financial services, we've often, we're drowning in data, right? Financial services has got so much data, it's not funny. I used to work for a bank who had a relationship with a very large market data vendor who at that point in time had 67 different major databases. We could consume all of it. Guess how many we actually consumed? I've got fingers left over on one hand, put it that way. So we often don't know exactly what to do with data. So the whole process of the Copilot stack is very much focused on how we can actually accelerate the process of actually getting data to value. So some of you will have probably seen Power BI co-pilots. Like when you look at that, that's absolutely amazing. So they're the sorts of experiences that we're talking about. How can you actually take data, compress it with the business insights, which is represented by the agents that the ISVs own because they understand the workflows, and get to that knowledge as quickly as possible? Funny, think of context as sitting in between data and knowledge. So if you've got an ability to understand the context of the outcome that's required, then you can reach into data sets that you might not normally have reached into to drive your ability to use that knowledge to make a different kind of decision. OK, any other questions? I'll get one while he's walking okay. up here. He's walking very confidently. So, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, maybe I have. Uh, I think the questions. Um, the first one could be 
we are talking about apps, workflow, and data. And if we talk about the entire process, so it's like a, the combination of the three of them. So if we can copilotize the processes, unifying agents, copilot, and data analytics, or what is, like, uh, what is happening now with data analytics? So data lakes is, you know, the primary product that we look at data lakes through is Fabric. So a lot of the investments that we're making in Fabric at the moment, the, I'm going to say, co-parts become easier with Fabric is probably, you know, sort of, it's not a marketing statement, it's just a statement. But, you know, sort of that's really the way that we're actually thinking about it. The, with good investments in the data layer, then all of a sudden the co-pilot elements become significantly cheaper. Okay. Or quicker. Yeah. Um... And the second question, um, the second question was when we talk about when we talk about uh, the Moody's um, uh, model. So, this what geographically coverage it it could have. So I I know that it depends of what is the the, the data that we are feeding to this agent. So now if we can use I don't know maybe the Moody's. Um, agent for Europe or for South America or for Africa, how can we make it work in other geographics? Sure. I'll give you the short answer and I'm happy to take it uh, a bit more uh, longer offline. So Moody's owns the world's largest database of private companies. It's 550 million entities inside that database. Just think of that as being a node in the network or a node in a semantic model. What attributes I know about that entity could come from us or could come from one of the other third parties agents that sit inside the ecosystem. So we're providing, Moody's is providing two services. One is, which entity are you talking about? And then the agents are saying, and what do you want to know about that entity? And so the same is going to be true for any other semantic concept. If you're interested in a location or a person or a transaction, then there's a node in the graph, if you like, that says, which location? And now you want to say, what do I want to know about that location? Which buildings are on that location? What weather events occurred at that location? And those data sources, again, could be from Moody's or could be from any other third-party data source. And all it needs to do is connect into that semantic model. And we're the providers of the semantic model for entities. Thank you. And sorry, the exciting thing about that for me is that concept of actually connecting to the other data sources. Yeah. So yes, Moody's is an exceptionally exhaustive, 550 different uh, companies and entities throughout the world. So answering your question, geographic location everywhere. But however, it's also how that can be supplemented by the connection to the other data vendors, whether they're internal or external. OK, well, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. And thank you very much, Nick, for joining me on stage. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.